Hello and welcome to Light the Stone Speak. This is a podcast where we talk about the latest in biblical archaeology. It's produced by the Armstrong Institute of Biblical Archaeology located here in Jerusalem, Israel. This next video is one that we produced under the name Watch Jerusalem a little while back, but we wanted to put it up on the channel so that you didn't miss out on any of this great content. Hello and welcome back to Watch Jerusalem. I'm your host, Brent Noctegal. Thank you very much for joining me today for this special program. Today I'm at the excavation site of Chebet Arai. This is in the Judean lowlands, right beside what was Philistine territory 3,000 years ago. And I'm here for a very important discovery, and I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Yossi Garfinkel, the head of the Hebrew Univers University's Institute of Archaeology, and he's going to be discussing this amazing discovery with us today. We are here because of the discovery of an inscription, a very important inscription that is the first time in history that we have the name of a biblical judge found anywhere in Israel. Perhaps you could just speak of what that name is, who the judge is, and the, the circumstances involving its discovery. <coughs> okay, the name uh, on the inscription is Yerubal. In the biblical tradition, we have Gideon, one of the important judges. He smashed the altar of the of Baal and uh, cut the Asherah. And his name is also his second name is Yerubal, which means he fight with the Baal. This is the biblical uh, interpretation of his name. The amazing thing is that our inscription is from the 11th century BC or end of the 12th, early 11th century BC, the time of the judges. And in the biblical tradition, we have uh, this person exactly <clears throat> in the same uh, period. So it's a nice correlation between uh, archaeology and the biblical uh, tradition. And we have it <clears throat> the same uh, uh, similar situation at Hirbet Kayafa. This is a site from the 10th century BC. We discovered the name Ishbal. And in the biblical tradition, we have few people called Ishbal, and all of them are from the 10th century BC. So you can see that the uh, name of the 11th century appearing on both <coughs> biblical tradition and archaeology, and then names of the 10th century BC appearing both in the biblical text and in uh, archaeology. So this, this um, Yerubal, or Jerubal in uh, English, uh, an anglicized version of that. Uh, this inscription you said is found in the right context, meaning that the period in which the Bible purports, the Bible says that, that he lived, is the same period in which you found this inscription. But you say uh, in your report that it's, it's impossible to be able to connect uh, your inscription of Jeroboam with the Jeroboam in the Bible. Could you just explain why that's the case? Jerubal, uh, Gidon, Jerubal in the biblical tradition is uh, his, area, his activity areas in the Jezreel Valley where he's fighting the Midianite. <clears throat> so it's uh, in the northern part of Israel. And our site, Rebet El Rai, is in Judah and uh, there is uh, 60, 70 kilometers apart from each other. But <clears throat> I never thought about this before, but uh, now that people are asking me, there is one way to connect, as a matter of fact, and this is to do petrographic analysis to the shared itself. And if the shared coming from uh, the Jordan Valley or the Israel Valley or the northern part of Israel, maybe it will be the same uh, person. But if the name, if the, sh the pottery vessel was made here, it, uh, it's possible that there were few people called Jerubal in the period. Right. So, I think in the in the press report it talked about how that. It, this could have been a personal vessel belonging to him. Uh, could it also have been an inscription on a vessel that has his name on it? But it, it does. It's not a personal vessel. The fact that you had more letters in the inscription that are after the name Jerubal um, indicates that it might not be a standalone person, or it could have been a, a larger, maybe an ostracon of some sort with a message. Or, or what are your thoughts about that? No, it, it was uh, written. It's not written on a shirt. It was written on the jar. And uh, from this jar, we have uh, we had uh, three uh, pottery shirt, which has uh, letters on them. Two of them fit to each other, and we get the Yerubal. And there's another part with the letter Ein, which doesn't fit. But it's, it can be that we have X son Ben, X Ben of Yerubal, or maybe the Yerubal son of, and we have the father. Mm. Uh, of Yerubal, or, may, or maybe Yerubal is the father. Many times people said not just the private name, but also the, the name of the father. Right. This was the situation in Hirbet Kayafa, where we have Ishbal, son of Beda. 
Mm-hmm. Bida was the father. We never uh, found the name Bida, Bida before, not in the biblical text and not in archaeology. So it's a unique name. It's possible that here is the same. That was uh, a name and the father. Mm-hmm. And Jerubal is either the father or the, or the son. Okay. Interesting. And I think, I just reading through the report, there was something interesting about the fact that this, this was a discovery that was made over a couple of seasons, right? The, the entire inscription, it took a couple of seasons to find it? It was excavated about uh, two years ago, uh, but uh, <clears throat> till we uh, clean it and decipher it, and we also make a small tent spit, and we found the inscription, all the, the parts there. And the next season, we enlarged the area, and we were hoping to find all the pieces of the jar and to glue it to do restoration and then the, le- the missing letter or the letters that are not connected we can see if they are before or after the inscription and we are uh, hoping, ho- hoping to find more pieces. So only after a year when we re-excavated, we have another season and we excavated the, the entire complex, and then uh, it was quite disappointing <laughs> not to find more pieces. So do you feel like uh, it was found in the middle of a silo, correct? And did mm-hmm. you find full vessels in the bottom of the silo or just broken vessels? And if that's the case... I'd like to go back to this idea that it could be an ostracon that was broken at the point of entry into the silo, or that you disagree with that and it it it, it was a full vessel in there at the, at a time. The way I see it, it was a silo, and people use it uh, for storage of grain and other uh, agricultural products for maybe twenty years, or thirty, or fifty, or sixty years. And then in a certain stage, it uh, became polluted maybe with animals or mm-hmm. uh, something. <clears throat> so it was not fit for storage anymore. anymore. And it became a, a refuse pit. Mm-hmm. pit. And people dump inside animal bones and broken shirt and all kind of garbage that accumulated in the house or in the courtyard because the open seal, silo, people can fell in. So they will uh, try to uh, fill it as quickly as possible. And the shards were found in this, uh, in the refuse, in this refuge pit, <clears throat> which was silo before. And but it's possible that if you enlarge the excavation around <laughs> it, maybe you find it in ten meters from the silo, right. the rest of the inscription. Right, it's also possible. So, could you just speak uh, in general about the the inscriptions from this period that have been found? Let's say the period of the judges. Um, I don't think there's too many. And what you have of what you've found, you have a the name of a biblical judge. I know we can't say that it was definitively uh, because of geographic circumstances, as you said, that it's so far from the area that Jerub- Jerubal Gidon was was known for. Mm-hmm. But the fact, how many other inscriptions have you found from this period, and what are their names? And here you've got, and just speak of the the coincidence. The relative coincidence of finding an 11th, uh, 12th century inscription and it has the name of a biblical judge on it. Basically, we, are, we have almost no historical information about the time of the judges. We don't have Egyptian inscription about it, we don't have Mesopotamian inscription about it, and also in Israel, <clears throat> this is almost the only inscription. I can think about Herbert Rada now, where they have a handle with few sign uh, on it. Then there were arrowheads which has names on it and people believe that they came from uh, El Khader near uh, Bethlehem, but they all came from the antiquity market. Okay. And we don't really know what is their dating, we don't know uh, where they came from, and even the authenticity is not uh, clear. So you cannot really use them as uh, references. And in any case, you don't have any name of a judge on these uh, inscriptions. So when you think about what do we know about uh, here, uh, late Canaanite inscription from the uh, 12th, 11th century BC, the answer is almost zero. Okay. And then we have the Rubal, the only inscription that we really have with a name, with a meaning, and it's also fitting to a judge. This is really unbelievable. So it is, un- that's what I want It's people. unbelievable, I yes. want people to know that it's not like we've got 12th, 11th century inscriptions floating around Israel. There's hundreds of them, and here's the first one that we find with a biblical judge. No, that's not the case. We don't have inscriptions. We find one, and it has the name of a biblical judge in it. And... Yeah, go, if you have comments. No, about the period of the judges, I start saying that we don't have any uh, uh, historical sources out of the Bible from the time of the judges. But we have the Mesha Stila, mm-hmm. which is from uh, the mid 9th century BC, so it's already 150 years after the end of the time of the judges. And this Moabite king said, Ve'ish Gad Yashav mm-hmm. Be'atarot Me'olam. 
said the, the tribe of God or the people of God lived in Atarot from ever. Right, right, right. And then you have the name of a tribe, God. Right, right. And this you don't have any name of uh, or the other 12 God, uh, tribes. Okay, so you had, to search, you had to search pretty hard then to find a... <laughs> but God in this case is from the mid 9th century BC. And not from the it's 11th, 12th century. It's a historical century. event. <clears throat> so uh, that's uh, really, Yerubal is the only inscription that we have from the time of the judges. And it's also happened to have a judge uh, written on it. Yeah. Okay, so just to, to last question here. Um, you said the, the area of influence of, of Gidon is, is in the north, uh, or further to the north than, than Judah. It's, the Bible doesn't record him being in this territory. Um, but you do have, you know, certain tribes, Ephraim even, desiring, I think it was Ephraim, I'm not sure, desiring to make him a dynasty. At least the Bible talks about uh, you can be king and, and you're, uh, Abimelech can be, you, you, this will be a dynasty that comes from you. And Gidon says no. So it, it seems to me like even though the biblical narrative story is very local, that his influence was the Bible indicates was outside was larger than that than that proximity would you would you agree and you know that his son Avimelech ruled in Shem after him so uh, it was not just an attempt it was really a attempt. dynasty he didn't want it he didn't want it at least that's he what he didn't it want it yes but his son was uh, he liked power very much <laughs> and the Bible didn't like him you know the right. <coughs> Mashal Yotam the right. One of the brothers, he killed all his other brothers, and uh, it's a nasty story. Right, all seventy of them or so. Yeah. Well, I just, I just don't, I just don't know what the other reporting is going to be about this. I know everyone's going to be excited about a biblical judge period inscription because the context matches, but I don't want to diminish the idea that this could be referring to the the original Jerubal, even if it is, as you said, maybe something mm -hmm. from the north that came to the came to the south. And um, if you have any final comments, I'd appreciate it. If not, I'm looking forward to joining you on the dig. And over find the next... another inscription. <laughs> and find another inscription. <laughs> well, if, if they haven't been found elsewhere and they're found here, the likelihood they'll be here. So, you know, the, the, if you look at the history of the Aleph Bet, so the earliest inscriptions are from around 1800 BC from Sarabit al Khadem and also Vadi al Khul in Egypt. So, and the Aleph Bet is uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs, basically, that were taken and used right. uh, for, uh, <coughs> for writing the first uh, Aleph Bet inscription. But then if you look at the Canaanite, uh, late bronze era, where do you have most of the, uh, these uh, Aleph Bet inscriptions? In, in Lachish. Oh, okay. The site of Lachish is the place where they kept the Aleph Bet and used it extensively relatively extensively during the late bronze. Mm -hmm. And then Lachish has been destroyed at around 1,150. Then from around 1,000 BC, we have a, a, again a, large, a, a nice number of inscriptions. Two inscriptions for my excavation at Hirbet Kayafa. And a lot Mazar found an inscription in Ophel with the same type of proto Canaanite letters. And you have from Bet Shemesh and also, also you have from, no, that's it, Jerusalem, uh, Kayafa to Tel Safi, also one inscription oh, okay. from Tel Safi. So you have Lachish here and then five inscriptions here. But in between 120, 150 years, you don't have even one inscription. And suddenly this site bridged the gap mm -hmm. between the, late, the last Canaanite and the first uh, king, kingdoms of uh, Judah and So you're saying there is a continuation. So you have a continuation and we are four kilometers from Lachish. Mm -hmm. And after the destruction of Lachish, this site became the, the largest uh, center in the region. So the knowledge of the Aleph Bet moved from Lachish to this site. And they kept it till it was adopted later by the kingdoms. And then you have it in Phoenician and Aramaic and Hebrew and Moabite and Ammonite and so on. So, so this is really these people it's kind of like a missing link in, in the chain of, of the chronology of how the Aleph Bet was exactly, was and I think that Aleph Bet is the, one of the most important intellect, intellectual achievement of humankind mm -hmm. because before it you have the Egyptian and the Mesopotamian writing systems which are extremely complicated mm -hmm. and only few scribes were able to read and write. Once you have the simple Aleph Bet, 
or the population is able to read and write. So, so people, this, people listening to this, no matter where you are, you've probably got an alphabet language these days. No matter what language, mm -hmm. we can be thankful uh, to, to this transition. Of, yeah, the people in Chirbet Arai read <laughs> from the Canaanite to the kingdoms of Israel and Sudan. This is amazing. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Garfinkel. Thank you for your interest.